is the word of the Lord. Please ride for the reading of the gospel. When John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered to them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds concerning John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? Behold, those who wear soft clothing are in king's houses. What then did you go out and see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is he of whom it was written. Behold, I am sending my messenger before your face who will prepare your way before you. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Way to make an executive decision there, Carolyn. <laughs> it works. It works. Well, it's good to hear you laughing. So, what brings you joy? The right song. The right song. I love you, Dave. Yeah. <laughs> Having the right song. Carolyn brings joy. What else brings you joy in your life? Family. family. And what about family? What, what's a kind of a, a picture of joy with your family? Uh, well, especially Christmas. Christmas, <laughs> coming together around, around the table, sharing stories, laughing. Uh, and the love, and the love God has for us brings joy. Amen. And that's what we're talking about today, right? It's joy. Yeah. Joy. We love joy. We love to be happy. It is a gift of God. And all good and perfect gifts come from who? Come from God. They do. They do, they do, they do. So welcome to Joy Sunday, where we recognize that the joy, or recognize the joy that comes with Jesus, our Savior at Christmas. Psalm 146, verse 5. We read this this morning. There's a goal in there, a beautiful goal about joy. Blessed are those whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord their God. I just kind of remember that. It's a, I love the Psalms. They, they teach me um, how to pray. They teach me the, the posture of, of a Christian that our hope is to be where? In the Lord. In the Lord. Yeah. We love, enjoy, and pursue joy. But we also can't hang on to it, right? You know, earthly joy. It can slip through the fingers so easily. But the path to joy and, and hope is what humanity many times is confused about. It must be paved without trials, challenges, and disappointments, right? You know, that's what, we're, what we want to believe. You know, joy only comes when life is going just the way you want it. That's the only path to joy, and that's what we're supposed to have. That's what we pursue. I enjoy when the weather is good, the sun's out, and, uh, and life is going okay. I, I really do enjoy that, and that is a gift from God. Yet we also know the storms come, right? Yeah. It's easy to see why the pursuit of happiness is a high value in our society. Who doesn't want to experience happiness and joy? The question is, 
how to have joy now or in whatever situation you're going through. What is the pathway to joy in our lives in December of 2022? The problem is when this value, the pursuit of joy, starts to reframe and reshape theology to fit our desired road of what we want it to look like. And my selfish, sinful nature can be attempted to embrace other gospels, which really are not good news at all. And, uh, and this is around since the beginning of time. Get rid of struggle and just focus on the good life. And, uh, and we see this sneaking in today in, in prosperity preachers, prosperity gospel. Uh, prosperity gospel is a, is a health and wealth gospel, the gospel of success. It is a religious belief among some Protestant Christians that financial blessing, physical well-being are always the will of God for them. And that faith, positive speech, donations to religious causes will increase one's material wealth. Material, and especially financial success, is seen as a sign of divine favor. Now, money is amoral. It's not good. It's not bad. It's just money. And, uh, but to see, is this only how God blesses? Yeah. So the prosperity gospel can set us up for some problems. Um, if God wants us to have the good life right now, what do we do with struggle? What do we do with problems? What do we do with doubts? What do we do with pain? It can make us liars, actually. The prosperity gospel or a theology of glory um, can say, no, I don't, I don't have problems. I, I'm just going to deny that. The only positive thinking. I'm only going to focus on the positive. That, that's it. It's good to be positive, but let's not deny when stuff is hard. We get tempted to put on a face that we don't have struggles. Nope, I've got the joy of Jesus. I don't have problems. I don't cry. I'm going to fake it till I make it. The prosperity gospel tempts us because it suggests that the Bible lays out how to have the good life now. Run away from false doctrine. And we need to run away from false doctrine because it reduces the cross of Jesus Christ to be like a pinata where tithing is a stick and we get to wield it to get whatever we want. And, and we need to pray uh, for some of the prosperity preachers out there, Joel Osteen, Creedle, Creeful Dollar, Kenneth Copeland, pray that they may receive the full gospel and that, because Jesus loves them so much and desire to set them free. The prosperity gospel reduces the life-saving life message of Jesus Christ to five simple steps to successful living. And whenever we read books like that, just do this, this, and this, and you will get the reward. It's tempting because I must confess, I am a control freak. I think we all are in some ways, right? We want to just, I want my life to go this way and, and I'm going to push it in that direction. That's very tempting. But the cross needs to be central for our lives. <sighs> that the cross may be central yeah, for our lives. To be patient with suffering, it says in James. The cross is not to be removed from our lives, but to seen as a, as a portal, a gateway to experience the kingdom of God now. When the devil was tempting Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism, first he, he tempted his identity, if you are the son of God, if you are the son of God. But the pathway the devil gave for him was to avoid the cross. To avoid the trials. You know, tell these bread, these stones to become bread. You know, bow down and worship me. I'll give you all the, the glory to take the easy way. And Satan wants to tempt us with that as well. Psalm 23 says, when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And a theology of glory <laughs> Uh, a prosperity gospel says that um, when I walk around the valley of the shadow of death, no, God meets us in the challenges and in the trials. Let's talk about John the Baptist, the ultimate anti-prosperity preacher. So how do you picture John the Baptist? So what did he wear? Camels, you know, like he has a camel hair, right? And so, what did he eat? Locusts and honey. What a, what a 
sketchy, sketchy man. <laughs> um, and where did he live? Yeah, yeah, out in the wilderness, out in the desert. So is some, you know, backwater preacher. It would have been... He is one of the most colorful characters in all of Scripture, really. And, and a loudmouth as well. Um, and in the Gospel reading, where is he at that moment? Yeah, he's in jail. He's in prison. So that's... You know, picture that. So John spoke out. He spoke truth. A very firm message. He, he didn't pull any punches addressing the Pharisees, uh, addressing Herod, um, addressing sin. Just a strong man of God. And how was he related to Jesus? Cousin. Okay? Very important to remember that. Remember, remember in the womb? You know? He responded to the presence of Christ in the womb. So we say, you know, in infant baptism, oh, they, they, babies can't know God. Well, wait a second. Here is in the womb, John is already responding to the presence of God. So this is an anointed man. Incredible things going on in his life. And now he's in prison. Maybe someone should have sent him Joel Osteen's, Osteen's book, you know, Live Your Best Life Now, when he was in prison. That could have been good comfort to him. No. John knew suffering. He, he wasn't scared of it. He, he spoke what needed to be spoken. And even if bad things were going to happen as a result, he didn't avoid trials. When I picture the faith of John the Baptist, I see strength. Um, just strong. I don't, this isn't someone wavering, very strong. Uh, an example uh, for all of us. When I think of doubt and I think of John, those usually don't come into mind. I think of doubting Thomas, you know, those kind of pictures in scripture or other people who doubted and weren't sure, the disciples running away from Christ before the crucifixion, not John the Baptist. So when I look at John I, and I look at myself, I go, Oof, I don't measure up to that. Not at all. I struggle, I have challenges, I have doubts. Yet here we have, when John, who was in prison, heard about the deeds of Messiah, he sent his disciples to ask him. To ask him what? Amazing. This is interesting. Yeah, who are you? This is Jesus' cousin. You know, he would have known the stories and, you know, everything and known his cousin. And, but here we have John the Baptist asking through his followers, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? Things weren't adding up for John. He was struggling. He was wrestling. That's good news for me. That's good news for all of us because wrestling is good. Hey, God, is this, is this what's going on? Is it this or is it this? You know, what is going on here? What did he actually know, John the Baptist? Even when I have encountered God in great ways through his word, uh, through people in the world, I still, even the same day, can have doubts about who God is, about his love for me, about myself. There's other struggles, too. When I served as, as a pastor in town, um, I felt that, that sometimes I needed to hide my struggles, to hide my doubts, to put on a positive face. Um, and there were there, then there were days I didn't like people and I didn't like my job. And the negative self-talk that went in my head that day was quite condemning in those days. Yeah, I felt like it's type of imposter syndrome. Oh, I hope they don't find out that I'm really a fraud, that I'm, I'm really wrestling with this. And I'm, I'm teaching a sermon, I'm teaching a Bible study, but inside I'm still wrestling with it too. Maybe you felt that too. I just, in, in order to be a, a Christian, I've got to make sure it, it looks like I've got it all together at all times. And that's what it means to be a good witness for Christ. It's not. That is embracing a theology of glory, that it's always, we always have it all together. And, and I find sometimes that actually pushes people away because they say, oh, I, I struggle, I'm a mess. I can't be like, I can't, I can't be as strong as you are. Today we get to come to the cross and find out how in our struggles beautiful things can happen because Jesus loves to show up there. Like in the Beatitudes, 
which are just completely messed up, right? Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are poor in spirit. Blessed are those who are persecuted. What? What's going on? Take a look at the Beatitudes. Uh, love is not in the Beatitudes, but it would weave it all together for sure. Yeah, in the fruit of the Spirit, yeah. Amen. Yeah. Oh, where am I now? There we go. <laughs> yeah. Jesus, or John, invites us to have a theology of the cross. And embracing a theology of the cross gives us permission to be more honest. It isn't do you struggle with, it's, it's when you struggle. This is the centrality of the cross in all areas of our lives. The suffering and pain is not when God leaves us, there God meets us. The pathway to joy in the Bible is one that typically want to reject, at least at first glance, that God can bring joy through trial, suffering, through meeting Jesus in the struggle. In the valleys as well as on the mountaintops, we can meet Jesus. He's in both. So give thanks when the family's all together at Christmas and it's just joy and like, yes, this is a gift of God. But what about in the hard? How do we meet Jesus in those times? Well, I get to tell you, I get to be an object lesson for today, okay? So that's one thing that's interesting about preaching. Many times you end up processing your own stuff. <laughs> as you, you know, God's word intersects with your life. And so I've had a, a very interesting fall. And uh, three, we three weeks ago, I think about three weeks ago, I found out that I have cancer. Uh, bladder cancer. Um, ended up with a, a polyp in my bladder. And uh, I was like, what? You know, I was just going through life. Things are just going along, going along, going along. But whenever you hear your name and the word cancer beside it, it's a scary thing. It's when, you know, when the doctor's talking to you, and many of you have experienced this, you don't remember anything else the doctor says because you're just like, what did you just say? You know, what's going on? So, yeah, this is like three weeks ago. Had that, they had an cancellation at the hospital, so I was able to have the polyp removed five days later. And, uh, and I'm like, was it cancerous or not? He's like, well, basically it's like 97% of the time this is cancerous, so we just treat it that way. Okay, that makes sense. So um, went through that, but that kind of, that kind of, it threw me. You know, you gotta tell your family, you tell your friends, what does this mean? Oh. We've all been through there, either for when our, ourselves or other people are waiting for results, right? And it's that unknown time when things kind of pause. So I'm at home recovering from this. I remember being in my backyard. You know, still, I just don't know what this means. It could be very positive, it could be negative. You know, don't know. There's varying degrees of cancer, of course. And, you know, standing in my backyard to see my playhouse back there, I'm like, Jesus, I want to see my grandkids. Like, this is part, I got my, I got a plan here, you know, for my life. And so there's part of that was the lament of just working through this, you know, like, no, this isn't happening. Oh, it is happening. You know, the anger, these things. Well, has God left me then? Do you love me? No, those weren't questions that I had. So I, I'm, I'm thankful that there's maturity in my, my faith. And I, even though I was angry, I was, uh, you know, about what was going on, I also, knew, I also knew, and I know, and I know, Jesus, you're going to meet me in this. Um, you will shape my heart. You will teach me. Now, I know, Jesus, you didn't cause this to happen in order to teach me a lesson. Bad things happen because we live in a fallen world. Sin is it's, it's running its course through the world. That's why this garbage stuff happens in our lives. God doesn't cause it to happen, it just, it comes. It comes. But God does not hide in those times. He, he reaches out to the brokenhearted, those who are mourning, those who are hurting, and he meets them in it. And uh, I remember uh, one day as I was recovering, I was just uh, doing some, some writing in my journal and um, just kind of thinking about how to go forward in this. And uh, I, I wrote there, I was like, God, I, I, gratitude and love, those were the themes that were coming up in my life. And this was a hint that I was starting to move towards 
acceptance of what this would look like, even though I was still waiting for results. Um, had it spread, blah, 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 blah. Um, but gratitude and love. I pictured a, you know, like a, in the biblical days, you think of armies going off to war and then these banners out front and the trumpets and, and I wanted to, gratitude and love to be those banners in my life that I can be thankful because I may have 50 years left, I may have five years left. You know, you just don't know. But just be thankful. Gratitude is a powerful weapon to have in life against discouragement. And love. You know, I've done big things in my life, but what really matters is just loving people. To love those who God brings my way. Just like I am loving you now by bringing you God's word. That's one way we can show love to others. And uh, actually, it's kind of funny. After I wrote this in my journal, then a couple days later, I was putting up my Christmas lights in my front yard. And uh, a young man came up to my door, and he was like, do you need any help? I'm like, uh... Okay. And he was just like an energetic, you know, like really, oh, it's, I love to help people. I'm like, is, is he trying to sell something? Is this a Mormon or a JW? You know, who is this, this young guy? And uh, he's like, no, I just like to help people. And no, oh, sure. So we get to know each other a little bit and start chatting. He's like, oh, you're such a nice person. You're just making my day. I'm like, thanks. And, uh, and we just sort of, I was almost done, so he just helped plug in the extension cord. Um, should have been here earlier. Um, but it was just one of these, and then he went on his way, and it was just one of these interesting things. I'm like, okay, God, yeah, you are paying attention just to be around, to, to love others and care for others uh, where they go. So interesting where Jesus shows up in our lives. So it was a journey. And then on Wednesday night this week, I got a call from my urologist, and he calls me up, and he says, Dean, I have good news for you. There was like a two to three to five percent chance this wasn't cancer, and it isn't. Yeah. Are you serious? <laughs> so, so, hallelujah. So, however, however Jesus wants to bring healing, I'll take it. All right? And so, was it cancer? Did Jesus heal it in the middle of it? I don't know. But regardless, yeah. I was like, whoa. So I had students coming to my house that night. Um, I got the call like 10 minutes before they, they arrived. So when they came, we gave a, a good toast and uh, celebrated together. And, uh, and my wife and I were like, oh, what a weird three weeks, you know, to go through. And um, as I kind of was like, oh, I got so much to think about. And as I'm processing this, it was interesting. There was a small part of me that was a little bit disappointed. And I was kind of like, disappointed? Why would I be disappointed to find out that I don't have cancer? And uh, obviously, I'm thrilled that I don't have cancer. Uh, but the disappointed part was like, well, the lessons that I learned, did they count? Do I just go back to the way my life was before? And I was like, no, no, that I can still embrace joy. I can still embrace gratitude, embrace love in this, that Jesus shows up in our struggle and meets us. He prepares a banquet before us in the presence of our enemies. Is this good news? This is very good news. He can meet with John the Baptist in the prison and have peace and have joy. So let us mine the gold when we go through challenges. Don't waste it and keep it. Jesus revealed to me once again what the opposite of faith is. It's not doubt, but it is control. That I want to control my life, I want to say where it's going, and I need to let go of that. And to embrace faith, to uh, revoke the benefit of seeking to be in control of my life, and just to let Jesus lead in love. Psalm 146, blessed are those whose help is a God of Jacob, whose hope is in their, the Lord their God. The Lord sets the prisoner, that's me and you, free. The joy that Jesus brings speaks to us right now and speaks to everyone who is in trial and in challenge. I think of uh, fellow believers, uh, and, and there's the people of Ukraine who live in fear and uh, of bombings and... Um, and I think that this, the message of Jesus coming can give them hope as well. I think their land has a lot in common with the people of Bethlehem 
occupied by foreign invaders living in fear. Yet that's where Jesus shows up as a fragile baby. It is my prayer that we will let our Old Testament lesson, Isaiah 35, define the way forward, the pathway, the highway to joy and peace, knowing that Jesus is in everything. He is the author of life. He invites you and I to let him be the definer of life. I'm going to read parts of our Old Testament lesson from Isaiah 35 to close. The desert and the parched land will be glad. The wilderness will rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It will burst into bloom. It will rejoice greatly and shout for joy. The glory of Lebanon will be given to it. The splendor of Carmel and Sharon, they will see the glory of the Lord, the splendor of our God. Strengthen the feeble hands, steady the knees that give way. Say to those with fearful hearts, be strong and do not fear. Your God will come. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the mute tongue will shout for joy. Water will gush forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand will become a pool, the thirsty ground bubbly springs in the haunts where the jackals once lay. Grass and reeds and papyrus will grow, and a highway will be there. It will be called the way of holiness. The redeemed will walk there, and those the Lord has rescued will return. They will enter Zion with singing. Everlasting joy will crown their heads. Gladness and joy will overtake them, and sorrow and sign will flee away. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.